very pressing questions, uh, you know, feel free to come back to us after the session. We can run past this and then, you know, break for the day. We have got an hour after this before, before dinner. So, feel free to come back to the questions. How's everyone doing? Are we actually okay? Yeah. I know it's been a long, long day, and uh, many of you probably traveled and got up, taking like early morning flights and stuff to come. So the way I'm going to handle this is, I have a 10 slide presentation out here, uh, which I intended to give, but I'll run through that very quickly. My objective here is to try to understand what are some of the concerns that you have, and then let's discuss that. Because we have about 30 minutes, and so we can, you know, run, spend 15 minutes going to presentation. Let's keep the presentation short, but let's have an ongoing dialogue on what are the concerns, and if I can help, you know, answer any of the questions that you may have out there. So, uh, I'll quickly start off by just introducing GBF, what we do. Uh, the Grassroots Business Fund is an impact investing fund. Uh, we are a spin off from the IFC World Bank Group. Uh, we were spun off about uh, into June 2008, and so it's been about it's been four years uh, since the spin off. And uh, we invest in social businesses around the globe, uh, and we have a hybrid approach of investing. So, what we do is we provide a blend of investment capital and capacity building grants to all our organizations and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along and the objective is to invest in organizations that are providing sustainable economic or social opportunity to people at the bottom of the pyramid. That's the key objective out here and that is the thesis out here is to use a mixture of commercial and grant capital to help social businesses who are providing sustainable economic opportunity out here. So what is this hybrid model that we keep hearing about in terms of GBF? The GBF has this hybrid model. Our model is to use both as an investment and grant capital. What we have learned over the years is that you can't just give commercial capital to an organization, especially a social business, in the early growth stages and walk away. That will not work. And the reason be, most of us out here are first time entrepreneurs. We are learning how to scale a business. We don't know how to run a 20 crore or 50 crore company. We are learning as we go along. So you know, having so that commercial money is required for the scale up, but something also required for the learning process, right? Someone needs to help us learn how to expand and grow. And that's where that grant capital come in. The way I think of it is when GBF is coming in, most of these companies are at a point of inflection in terms of growth. We are ready to scale up. But for us to scale up, we need to build in those building blocks, you know, financial management, governance and all these different things. But our commercial capital cannot be used for that because I need commercial capital for capital expenditure, for working capital, for paying my bills. So if I start, you know, overloading all my overheads, you know, building these blocks, my business will not scale up, I will be too busy. But the idea is use this grant money that we have, or what we call capacity building money, to build this building block so that when it's time for scale up, we are ready to shoot and you know, to reach that scale. So, one thing that, the one question that comes up is, you know, GBF is charging, you know, X percent. One thing to understand is, in fact, investors are not subsidized capital. The idea right here is that no one's going to charge, you know, 6 or 7 percent because it's an impact, industry, uh, impact investment. We are as competitive, competitively priced as normal funds would be. The difference out here is there is a gap in the market that people are not addressing. And it's difficult and the reason why they're not addressing is because the businesses that you work with are challenging. They are very, very difficult businesses. Running a business is difficult. Then you add, you know, trying to address challenges of the BOP out there, you make it exponentially more difficult. So the idea is to help businesses like that using the investment capital and the grant building. But as I said, the investment capital is usually is usually is usually used for working capital or for capital expenditure, and uh, our investment size is about half a million dollars to two million dollars. The grant capital that we use, we put in about ten percent of the investment amount as grant capital, and that is normally used for building your know, financial management. Most of the companies that we work with have probably not built a budget, or if they have, they build it because of an investor coming in, but we don't track it on an ongoing basis. So if I ask you, how much money do you need for the next 12 months, do you know? And do you know where that money is going to come from? Most companies will have an answer, but it will be very vague. And do we track it so that, you know, as that number is changing along, we also changing our expectations. We know how to do that. You know, uh, inventory is only a big problem with companies out there. Uh, 
we have the AP20 rule that we heard about. Normally, you'd see most of the sales coming from 40% of your products. And most of the entrepreneurs spend a lot of time trying to raise money. Why? Because I don't have cash. But if you go down the balance sheet, you'll see inventory and accounts receivable have a lot of cash blocked in them. And they can really be freed up if you manage that properly. And that's what financial management can do. It can help us better run our businesses. Again, there's governance, there's MIS systems, there are different sets of challenges that most enterprises face and that's what we want to address using our grant money. And the way the grant money is programmed is during the due diligence process and even post-investment, the enterprises and us sit together to understand what are the risks and opportunities that we are facing. Which and of those, what should be addressed using commercial capital and what should be used using grant capital. And that's how we program that grant. And there's only a cost share. The company pays 30-40% we prepare the rest of that. And even that, some of that is returnable grants. Some of that uh, could be reimbursable grants. So let the program uh, uh, run through. If you achieve the milestones, we'll reimburse you for that expense. So that's the way the grant capital works. Uh, the investment criteria. What type of what is the thought process that we are going through when we are looking for companies to invest in? So the way I categorize them is there is a set of business criteria, there is social and then there is financial. The first three is what I would classify as uh, the business criteria. The key thing out here is the management team. Because none of us can predict the future, right? That's not possible out here. Things will go haywire. The business plan will change. The key thing is do I trust the management team? Are they strong enough that they can meet the challenges that will be posed to them as a business executive? Can they execute on this business plan? And so, so that is I think the, the crust of most of the due diligence. Do I trust my management team out there? If that issue is taken care of, I would say 30% of the due diligence is done there. Then we come to the business model. Do I believe this business model? Can this business model scale up? What are the challenges? What are the inherent risks in the business model? How are we going to mitigate this business model? Those are key things that we look at. Uh, then the, the other thing is competitive advantage. You know, how are we different from competition? That's another key question that we need to answer. And if competition come, comes in, will it completely wipe us out, or can we still scale and grow the way we think we want to? The next one is again social criteria. Uh, uh, what services or what economic opportunity are we providing to people at the, at the BOP? How do we capture that? And is that linked with the business model? Is the business model and the criteria and the social impact uh, you know, working together or are they threats to each other? As the business scales up, will the company be able to maintain its social mission or not? Many times you see there is a conflict between the social mission and the business mission. So you know, how is the company balancing the two together and can the two scale up together? That's pretty important out there. Again, uh, one thing interesting about GPF as compared to other investors is uh, a very small piece of our investments is pure equity uh, and that is because of the way we are funding. Most of the investments that we make are quasi equity instruments. So these are, uh, and I won't go into the details of them, but what they pretty much mean is these are loan like instruments where there is an interest component and then at some point there is an exit. Uh, this is, as I said, we operate globally, so this is a, a, a global portfolio. Uh, India being uh, one of the largest uh, pieces out there. Actually, uh, this number is slightly outdated right now. Our global portfolio has grown significantly since uh, this slide was put together. In terms of the sector, we work in agri business, in artisan, and in BOP services. So we, we work across the globe. The only thing that we don't do is microfinance. We don't invest in microfinance organizations. Uh, list of uh, the companies we've invested in India. Uh, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with some, if not all of these organizations, so I won't go into the details of these. Uh, I think this is uh, the last slide and I think probably I'll spend some time on this, is understanding the due diligence process from our perspective. Uh, it normally takes, I would say, four to six, if not eight months for the entire due diligence process to start uh, from the beginning to the end. And it's important to understand what is uh, the investor and the investee in terms of, you know, what are we talking about at different stages and what is the investor looking for. So in, in step one, as we say, we're looking at the business model and the management team. This is, you know, we just sat down, we're trying to understand what does this company do and why does it do that? Where is the gap in the market and what does the management team? Then the past performance. That really helps us understand where the company has headed over the thought pattern has been of the entrepreneur or of the team. Uh, then the use of funds. If you're looking for a million dollars or two million dollars or X amount, what are we going to use that money for? 
over a period of time and is there a serious plan in place or has this been an excel modeling exercise you know someone sat down together for us someone sat together for two weeks and put together this fancy excel model which shows all different flows of money but does it really link to the operations if i'm saying i'm going to scale up from you know x to 2x do we really have a plan on how that scale up is going to happen I need to, you know, have X number of more sales people on my team. I need to build X number of, you know, uh, what do you call self-help groups. How is that going to really operationally work? Has that been thought through or not? Those are the key things to to put together while putting together this fancy Excel model because Excel cannot drive the business. It can hopefully just reflect what we are thinking about. And the key piece out here is again risk and mitigants. Uh, the way uh, we think in GPF is all companies have risk. The idea is how do we understand those risks and put together a mitigant plan. In most cases, we don't. In the, we we decide not to invest in a company not because we are, we are because the risks are too high. It's because uh, we could not come to an understanding on these risks. If we can come to an understanding and put together a plan on how to mitigate them using technical assistance, using different tools that we have, that's the objective of this exercise. How do we understand the risk and put together a plan to mitigate them? Uh, the next stage, uh, so after the initial discussion stage, uh, we normally, so again this is all very high level, the first stage, like in terms of 2 to 6 weeks. And then when we go back to investment committee and we get approval for due diligence. Is this, a, and what we are testing in this phase is, is this company a good fit for us? Is this a company that we think we want to work with and vice versa, hopefully the company wants to work with us also. Because remember, an invest, when you are getting an investor, you are getting a long term partner. And I call this the dating period. You know, you are dating to figure out whether you want to marry this person or not. Because you probably have an investor for seven years, who's, and the investor is going to give money and walk away. We are a very, very activist investor. We want to partner with companies. We don't invest, but we are to form partnerships. And the idea is, how can we use our learnings to help grow the business? That's the framework that, I, that we approach our partners with. So, so, the, so the initial discussion is, or actually the due diligence is the dating period. So that's how I think of it. So the second uh, part is once that we've got approval for due diligence, we go into the detailed due diligence process. And that's when we normally come for a, for, for a week and sit down with our clients. And we go into details of the first section. So the first section is not complete. We've got a high level understanding. Now we're going into more operational details out here. And in addition to that, we're looking at the financial plan, putting together a capacity building plan. That is the grant money. How we're going to use that grant money out there. And then uh, reference checks and term sheets. The last two pieces is, you know, once the business model and, and everything has been understood, we go after the diligence to investment committee to uh, present the uh, the case. Once that approved, then we go back and say, okay, fine, you know, we agreed on a term sheet initially, all, but my but my investment committee has recommended these changes. So can we negotiate and come to an understanding? So even the post term sheet, sometimes there's slight changes that are made because the investment committee has requested for them, and then we try to close out uh, the agreements. The last part is the conditions of disbursement. In every agreement, you will see a list of things that need to be done before the cash goes out. Sometimes that can take two weeks. We've seen that take two months also. So that's important to understand. And then finally comes the disbursement. As I said, I want to run through this. So I really want to understand if you have any questions and concerns, and we can discuss them. Anything? Uh, you are ready for the your first investment, I guess. Maybe an investment out there. Go after this particular whole exercise. And that shows that if I am going to do all this, I am going to take an investor, I will go to the bank and get it done. If you can need an equity investor, why do I need to save 20%, 30%, and I have made a headache, I have a board member, everything. All this thing is special, I am talking only about impact. And this is my practical experience. You know, we are getting funds at no cost, zero cost, no interest, nothing. And this 10% of grant model, even though NABAD has been, uh, NABAD is now changing the model. They were also under 20% grant now, they are also becoming banks. If you are, if you are, if you are looking at an impact fund solely as a source of money, you should not go to an impact fund. So as I said, we are here to form partnerships. We are not here to, dis to just give money. What is the question? Why I should partner with you? Exactly. So the, the key thing is, that's why I said, this is like a marriage. During this process, as the as the fund is trying to figure out whether I should invest in this company or not, you should actively be trying to figure out 
do I want to get money from this fund or not? That is a very very important question because that is going to determine how you do run your business. Because the fund has priorities, it's going to have a say in how things are done. So, so that is something you got to figure out. What I tell people is, we have we have been working with several businesses and seeing them scale. During that period, we at least we believe we have learned something that is of value add to our investees, and that's why we are active as investors. We want to help at least uh, talk about what we've learned and make sure that our partners don't repeat those mistakes. Uh, in the session before this, we are looking at you know, supposing your company that makes a five to seven crore kind of turnover and ready to scale up and uh, access this uh, uh, impact fund. Let's say five to seven years, what is the kind of expectation you have as, as a, uh, for the top line? Given the nature of businesses we are in, see, uh, it's it's a very difficult question to you why because it's even the industry, right? You know, agri business, you're in BOP services, you're in different types of industry. So, uh, and depends on you know what your margin is. If you're a low margin business, then I'm hoping to scale rapidly because that's how you generate profits. If you're a high margin business, you know. So, I think the the idea is to have. I, I can't come with you know I'm expecting a five x or six x. It really depends on do we have realistic expectations on the ground, which is linked to the business model. I think that's the key thing I'm looking for. Do I really believe in these projections, and are they linked to the operations? And is the management team strong enough to execute on them? What is your return expectation? Oh, my return expectation. Sorry, I think I thought it was revenue expectations. No, I mean, top line would determine you know how fast the company has grown and how you can exit, right? So our return expectations, I think, again uh, depends on. As I said, uh, we do a lot of quasi-equity instruments. So it depends on the type of uh, guarantee we have. So it can, uh, in terms of uh, rupee cost to the company, it can range any one, anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. Depending on the type of collateral I have, depending on the type of business which there's, so all of that factoring by pricing. Sorry, collateral means, for example, uh, in some cases the promoter will say, I will buy you out at the end of seven years, and I'm and, and I'm going to give you a guarantee, and I have assets to back the guarantee. So in which case. My risk goes on significantly. You want collateral for the equity investment? I said, I said, we don't do equity. We do quasi equity instruments. We do. Impossibility equity and the whole definition I got confused today. I'm telling you that you need a collateral and guarantee to fund me a business. I didn't say that. What I said was, if there is collateral, the price, the the, the return expectations go down and because the risk. How do from a social uh, business? So, uh, how do we exit from a social business? So I think there are different types of exits, right? One is, and I said, we are not a, uh, we are not uh, like other uh, impact investors who do pure equity play or who do pure equity. So the answers I'm giving is very specific to GBF. I would not generalize them. Uh, so if I look at our global portfolio, right? Our group, the instrument that we use primarily is royalty-based loans, which means these are loans and the money comes back from the cash of the company. And you have interest, the different levels of interest rate out there. In India, we cannot do loans because of the government of the regulations. So we use quasi-equity instruments. But the intention is still the same. The intention is, I want to put my, uh, I want to, I want to invest in a company that's going to scale up. And hopefully, over a period of time, as the company scales up, it is able to pay me back through the cash generated by the company. If not, you know, are the promoters willing to back it up? If not, do we really see a third-party exit out there? Different modes of exit, and depending on the again the type of the industry, depending on the type of business, the promoters, all of that come into play. There is no one size fits all. It's very very customized because all the businesses you are working on are very very different. So we can't come with one magic formula to address everyone's challenges. It has to be custom made. The capacity building plan and the investment structure is very customized. As I said, if you're looking for GBF for money, Just this is the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, if you're looking, yeah, from an investment perspective, yes, yeah, that is true. One question: Your you are talking investment or you are talking capacity building? I am talking about grant capital. So grant capital. So in terms of one of the things that I had up there was management team strengthening. 
So one of the challenges that people face is, you know, I want to hire a CFO but I can't because it's too expensive out there. So we say, okay, fine, maybe we get, you know, maybe for the first year we subsidize 50% of that. So, you know, you can see, uh, you know, the value out of a CFO or a CEO and then hopefully after a year you are generating enough cash flows to meet that. So yes, we do help with management teaching also. How do different possibly to make it Equity is pure equity. Quasi equity is what I think. Uh, an example of quasi equity is compulsory convertible ventures. That's quasi equity. Yeah, I think we should take that discussion offline to share a speech because yeah, yes, it's not possible. Equity and quasi equity and debt. My my company works in uh, cash digital space. We basically distribute enough money, pension money, and we provide banks services to our community. So, what is your take on this question? Like, we have, uh, we have right. But we have not looked at a company in that sector so far. So I would not, I don't have enough information to comment that. I'll be interested to take a look and figure out whether it's a good fit for us. I don't know. Anything else? Thank you for your time and good luck to you. Uh, it's uh, in the back here, so in case you have any follow-up questions, you can talk to him. Uh, so, we bring the, uh, we bring the program to close right now. Uh, we have dinner at 8, 8 o'clock, 8.15, around 8.15, uh, you could join us, uh, you could all come back to the dining hall where you had your lunch. Um, and hopefully, uh, the director of uh, Vintech may join us as well. So, it's a good opportunity to interact and understand more about the tech, but feel free to use this time to uh, Apart from um, the director, few of our uh, senior faculty members who are uh, interested and working in this area will also be there. Uh, though we have the marketing and branding session for post lunch, we are shifting it in the morning. So we are going to start uh, with that today in the morning. Uh, you get an, uh, you get some uh, idea on how marketing can be used for social enterprises and uh, what, how marketing and branding is of relevance to every enterprise. Then after that we have uh, we have about some hours dedicated specifically for a pitch presentation, which means to, uh, which, which is scheduled for the 15th of October. So there are mentors uh, we uh, got to help you work on your pitch. So today, I'm hoping some of you already worked on your uh, presentation techniques that we had circulated earlier. If you have, then it will be great because they will review your presentation, they will give you some inputs so that you can start you can rework on it. This pitch presentation which you will be making, you will, uh, I mean, you are preparing right now, will be, then you need to come and present on 15th of October in front of a grand jury. And uh, based on that, the awards are going to be, uh, the recognition is going to be announced, right? So this is an important part of what you're going to be doing today. And uh, we also have a small session where you can come and do a mock pitch to a group. So we'll be dividing you into groups. And after you take some inputs, you can come back, you can present this to your group, get some more feedback and read. And once you go back home, you have an, uh, about 10 days to prepare this presentation further before you come and present it in front of the track. So just take this time in terms of understanding how a pitch is done, putting all the inputs there and getting all the feedback from everyone around you so that at the time when you are in front of the grand jury, it's, it's a lot more, you know, you really work towards making this presentation. <coughs> also, uh, as you are aware, a grand jury is uh, comprises largely of investors. So what they would be looking at is, is from a perspective of whether your business model is great and I think Pratish took you yesterday in terms of what are the elements of uh, you know, what what are the elements of how what investors look for. And today he's going to also take you through in terms of what a pitch should look like. Uh, that's largely the two main sessions. And the third session is going to be by uh, Richard uh, Vengarton, our MD of Intelligent. He has vast experience in building teams. And he's also going to talk a little bit about how any organization can build their own teams, 
what it takes to win uh, second round leadership, how to transfer motivations, visions, values to the rest of the team.